Uh, my name is Brandon Morgan, and I teach History and Latin American Studies at CNM. Um, I recognize quite a few of you, so welcome and welcome to those of you who I, I don't yet know. Um, we're very excited today to have the last installment of our Latin American Studies speaker series uh, with Dylan Maynard, and I will give him a formal introduction here in, in just a moment. Uh, before I do that, I just want to recognize the partnership that we've been able to have with UNM, uh, specifically with the Latin American and Iberian Institute over the last several years. Um, we've also been working with them a little bit more closely uh, through the Mellon funded Humanities Now grant that we share with, uh, with UNM to uh, promote the humanities and the liberal arts and to work on uh, clarifying and providing stronger transfer pathways for CNM students in humanities programs. Um, among the great things that we've been able to do with our partnership uh, beyond, you know, just the, the uh, very positive outcome of having more students transfer uh, to UNM in Latin American Studies is um, building up CNM's Latin American Studies curriculum. And so with the support of the LAII over the last few years, we've been able to create an intro to Latin American Studies course. Uh, we've also been able to have a study abroad program. Um, so we were able to go to Antigua and Guatemala a couple of years ago now. Uh, we would have gone last May, but you know, um, <laughs> pandemic. So uh, we're hoping that May of 2021, we'll see a, a renewal of that program. We're going to once again go to Antigua. Um, so if you're interested in that or in anything else to do with Latin American studies, um, the humanities at CNM UNM, um, I will put my email in the chat. You can you can contact me, and if I don't have the answers, I can definitely put you in contact with the people who do. Um, so once again, thank you all for coming. Um, it's my honor now to introduce uh, our speaker today, Dylan Maynard. Um, Dylan entered UNM's history doctoral program in the fall of 2017. He completed his MA in world history at New York University, and he completed a BA in history and political science at Monmouth University. He specializes in Latin American history and the study of gender and sexuality. His dissertation is tentatively titled The Marshall Middle Class, Military Families, Modernization and Counterinsurgency in Cold War America, or excuse me, Cold War Argentina. And so I imagine um, that his talk today will uh, be connected to that larger project. And so without any further ado, um, I turn the time over to Dylan. All right, uh, thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Marlene, for, um, for the introduction and hosting the event. And thanks uh, everybody for coming out uh, on this Tuesday afternoon. So today I'm here to talk about um, locating the Marshall middle class. So uh, a case for bringing military families into Argentina's history of counterinsurgency and Cold War modernization. And I am of course, Dylan Maynard and I'm a PhD candidate in the history department uh, at UNM. So Argentina's military officers and their families had long enjoyed by the 20th century, the mid 20th century, a privileged status in society, right? Um, with most professional soldiers coming from the middle and upper classes. Um, however, by the mid 20th century, their status would take on new meaning as the country grappled with political instability and economic development during a global cold war. So because of their specialized training, um, officers were educated in the latest technology and by virtue of the military's political power, uh, they were also well positioned economically compared to other white collar and working class Argentines, which I'll, I'll elaborate on in a few. Uh, what's more, as Argentina's post-war military became more involved with things like managing industry and industrial expansion, officers became uh, the foot soldiers, so to speak, uh, of development, um, who provided cr a crucial component to the military's plan to modernize Argentine society economically, uh, but also socially um, through these kind of shared military values. Uh, and the main goals of which were really at the time to transcend uh, Peronism as a political kind of force, um, to defend against um, growing communist influence around the world, especially after 1959. Uh, and as generals saw it, you know, to regain kind of this lost international prestige, 
So this two-part plan, right, to um, modernize, you know, economic and social modernization, it also made up the support, the ideological support for the military's counterinsurgency against, you know, quote unquote, subversion, right? So if, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with the term, subversion is kind of something, a broad phrase that generals used uh, to denote any behavior that really ran contrary to their mission, right? And we hear, especially in the historiography of Argentine, you know, Cold War Argentina, we hear kind of generals use the phrase uh, counter subversive or anti subversive warfare um, in conjunction or in tandem with kind of like counterinsurgency doctrine and things like that. So, you know, the, the modernization plan made up its ideological support, but the material support for modernization and for its modernization project, how it would kind of take shape on the ground, it really rested on people belonging to the martial middle class who were, or the MMC, as you can see, who were families experiencing kind of a fundamental change in the way that the military operated, uh, who also had the potential to represent a synthesis of the military's plan for economic and social development. So what my research is about. So through my research, I attempt to trace the emergence of what I call the martial middle class alongside the Argent uh, Argentine military's modernization theory and projects, right? And it's well-known adoption of counterinsurgency warfare between really the late 50s uh, up until the early 1970s, um, which culminated in 1976 with uh, the so-called dirty war. And while there's a wide body of literature that documents the emergence and effects of counterinsurgency, I really aim to introduce kind of a new angle to this discussion. And that is, you know, how did families slash workers belonging to the officer corps navigate, you know, modernization, the military's modernization theory and its projects, you know, and by extension, its development of counterinsurgency doctrine during a revolution within the officer corps that introduced more, you know, white collar, uh, so to speak, forms of labor. Um, moreover, you know, what can we learn about the ways in which you know, these top-down plans or projects took shape on the ground and how they related to the military's professional culture. You know, in other words, how did the military leave its own mark on plans to modernize the country after Juan Perón was forced out of office? So in an academic sense, uh, the high command's theorization of national development, you know, it certainly had its intended goals, right? Like I said, overcome Peronism to uh, thwart communist takeover and international prestige. Um, but as the people meant to really effectuate and reflect these goals, how did, you know, the officer corps and its families influence modernization as well as its securement through counterinsurgency, you know, in their daily lives, in terms of their everyday politics, uh, with their own practices, conceptions, uh, and beliefs about what modern communities should even look like. Uh, so in other words, you know, who were the families that comprised the martial middle class and how did you know their everyday politics influence this you know really what we know is a top-down project from the bottom up and last you know why families per se you know uh, this detail speaks really to the gender dimension of my project um, as we may know you know and that's a, a common part of you know argentine cold war argentina's historiography um, right-wing military governments were notoriously and often violently opposed to conceptions of gender or gendered relationships that ran contrary to, you know, conservative doctrine. So that is, you know, to changing ideas about relationships between men and women uh, that challenged kind of these prevailing male-dominated hierarchies. However, you know, as past scholars have shown, you know, class-based and professional identities, so, you know, even military identities, uh, produce, but are also produced by gendered identities and gender relationships. Uh, and by the 1960s, while the military was becoming, you know, more quote unquote white collar, new understandings of gendered sociability uh, and gender relationships were really sweeping Argentina's middle classes, um, you know, which included uh, military professionals. Uh, they were part of that change. And at times, you know, these, these new ideas, these changes sought to modernize relationships between men and women. However, that's not to be confused with equalizing them, right? So my dissertation really holds that in order to fully understand Argentina's, you know, Cold War military, its culture, and even kind of the formal politics of the officer corps and, and governing juntas, we must take into account how professional families 
structured their relationships of gender, right? Uh, in their familial households, as well as their communities, you know, in terms of like how they contributed via reproductive labor to the military's kind of more um, formal projects of modernization. Uh, and all the while during this period of change within the military and society. And the logic being really is that, you know, these top-down changes um, are only really effective if, you know, the people that are meant to carry them out do so in, in certain ways, right? And sometimes people are coerced to, to, to act. Uh, oftentimes they can contest changes and resist. Um, and in the canon of Argentine historical literature, we admittedly don't know much about the officer corps and its members uh, outside the formal politics of, you know, governing juntas. Um, so I think kind of like adding this dimension of figuring out how professional military families and communities navigated and negotiated this change on the ground can reveal how their actions, you know, had wider effects in the country, but also transnationally, you know, uh, especially like if we remember, you know, the military was, the Argentine military was part of a network of many states engaged, many militaries engaged in counter Cold War counterinsurgency, you know, anti-communism. So, you know, and this kind of would tell us how these families could have more influence or at least affected this, these relationships domestically and internationally uh, in the context of a global Cold War. And since, you know, the martial middle class has really yet to appear as a historical subject, you know, that's, that's my job, uh, we don't know much about professional military families, you know, however, this lecture is really meant to shed light on, let's say, the historiographical possibilities that make a case for understanding the Argentine officer corps, you know, military rule and Cold War development by investigating these martial middle class communities. And as I'll show, I think, you know, there's ample reason for historians to begin investigating the officer corps in contexts outside of the governing juntas. So, you know, today my goal really isn't, provide, isn't to provide like this complete history of the Argentine military or, or, or Argentine Cold War history, uh, as much as kind of to lay out my research, which, you know, I'm still working on, I'm still forming. Um, and any feedback or constructive criticisms or suggestions and questions are more than welcome afterwards. Um, but before I go deeper into this, you know, let me provide at least some background information on the history of Argentina's armed forces. So the historical backdrop, right? Uh, and this is really predominantly from 1955 to 1975. So in the history of Argentina in the 20th century, the armed forces have often been, you know, in some respect, central to the country's politics. Um, as military and political historians have shown, the ideological beliefs of the officer corps, you know, mainly expressed as you know, this strong aversion to President Juan Perón and his enduring legacy of pro-labor populism, was the driving force behind the country's turbulent politics after 1955, when a group of officers ousted Perón and established a revolutionary military junta to run the government. And, you know, a junta, if I'm using this term a lot, it's really just a council of generals, right? So for this council of generals, the most pressing objective, uh, objectives at the time were to overcome Peronism uh, and to stabilize an officer corps that it viewed as thoroughly politicized. So, um, you know, from mass purges uh, and really the corrupt promotion of Peron's military allies. However, you know, these goals were only first steps toward a more fundamental plan to develop Argentine society to a point where you know, mass prosperity and economic growth could eclipse the supposedly destabilizing effects of mass politics, you know, which they, you know, they understood as Peronism. And they really you know, were reeling you know, in their minds from the effects of, of Peronism over the last you know, 10 years. Um, and by mid-century, you know, Peronism was the strongest organizing force in the country. You know? But after the successful Cuban revolution in 1959, generals also began to fear that Peronism and you know, these mass politics could weaken the country and make it vulnerable to a communist takeover. Um, you know, we often think of you know, the officer corps, particularly in, particularly in Argentina you know, and Latin American dictatorships in general as being kind of cynical and being you know, the military kind of searching for power or at least trying to use certain rhetorical or discursive arguments to gain power, which, you know, is sometimes true, but it's important to remember that for the officer corps in particular, communism and, and Peronism and mass politics, you know, revolutionary politics was also a very existential threat to them, you know, and it's important to remember after the Cuban revolution, you know, Fidel Castro sent Batista's officer corps to the firing squad. 
So for Argentine generals and officers, this was a very existential threat. They saw their lives, uh, they feel, felt their lives were on the line, which may have been true, right? So for Argentina's professional military men, the solution to you know, political unrest lied in developing the economy through industrialization uh, and market-based economics, while at the same time providing kind of these Catholic moral guardrails, so to speak, um, which could temper the wealth inequality and kind of social unrest that they believed led workers and other Argentine citizens to support revolutionary political movements in the first place. Um, and the result really ended up as kind of markets and morals is how we can think of them. And it's also, I think, important to note at this point that, you know, the officer corps, the Argentine officer corps of the 50s and 60s, you know, while they certainly weren't communists, right, they were anti-communists, they also weren't these neoliberal kind of free market types that we associate with other Latin American dictatorships, particularly like Pinochet's regime in Chile and the Chicago boys, um, and even kind of the junta, the Argentine junta that took power in 1976 and oversaw the dirty war, right? Those were really kind of what we think of as these neoliberal free market, completely deregulated uh, economy types. However, you know, these officers in the 50s and 60s were much more pragmatic when it came to um, how they understood capitalism. Um, you know, they supported a, a state planned economy to a degree, and they understood that capitalism, if it was left unregulated, it could lead to certain inequalities that ignited these political crises, right? But I don't want to say that they were moderates per se. You know, uh, we can definitely, you know, however, we can definitely describe the Argentine officer corps, at least in mid century, right? Um, in the years leading up to the Dirty War, they were mostly liberals, you know. However, you know, in a classic sense, however, there was a sizable nationalist contingency within the officer corps that was more kind of um, overtly right wing. Uh, and they favored, you know, a state planned economy as well, but they also favored a dictatorship. They did not want civilian controlled government. And these were kind of the two main factions in the officer corps at the time. You had on the one hand, these liberal constitutionalists, uh, we call them, who favored kind of a civilian government, but also these Catholic nationalists on the other hand. Uh, importantly, you know, their disagreement was really, I would say a matter of means rather than ends, right? Both kind of wanted to modernize the country uh, and achieve kind of this national greatness, they put it. Um, and both were anti parentist right? However, they just saw different paths on how to get there. So the military's plan was to modernize the country was both defensive and offensive, right? And throughout the 1960s, Argentina's top generals framed their struggle to move society forward, you know, past what they viewed as these outmoded political arrangements by forming a new discipline and kind of um, adopting a new discipline of Cold War counterinsurgency that was growing increasingly popular uh, in militaries throughout the globe. And although the army used violent tactics uh, and violent force to suppress armed revolts, uh, worker uprisings uh, in various parts of the country, markets and morals proved to be the military's preventative measures against you know, revolutionary or social upheaval. Um, and, you know, and these things included things like increased foreign uh, investment, uh, um, austerity measures and deficit, like controlling the deficit uh, and a clampdown on labor unions and the CGT. These offered one side of the coin while, you know, policies defending you know, nuclear family, Catholic uh, morals and practices, um, and, and, and even things that straddled in between like property ownership, um, you know, these were all attempted to ensure that Argentine society would maintain its commitment to this supposedly primordial past, right? That they'd seek economic growth and prosperity without sacrificing this, you know, the unique character of the nation. And up until this point, I've kind of given you the laid out, laid out the military's plan for modernization. It's modernization theory, if you will. Um, but, you know, we don't typically think, especially in the US, right, with a military that's less engaged in politics, we don't typically think of the military, the army as something that is meant to modernize or develop the country, right? We have like a, an army corps of engineers that works on infrastructure projects, but like more theoretically speaking, you know, we don't typically associate the military with Nash at this, or at least at the center of national history, right? Like, like the officer corps did in Argentina. But it's important to ask, you know, how did the military, particularly the officer corps, come to see itself as the main force tasked with modernizing the country? You know? um, and this coincides with kind of 
military professionalism and professional militarism, which I'll get into. Um, so the military's outlook that it needed to balance its forward-looking vision with a deep commitment to its past uh, had been fostered within the officer corps really since the turn of the 20th century, uh, when it first became what we call professionalized. So from approximately 1890 to 1940, the Argentine military underwent a significant modernization process in its own right. You know, uh, German and French military missions entered the country and trained cadets. Uh, they instilled them with you know, technical expertise, a sense of cohesion, uh, corporateness, and kind of the idea that they should stay out of politics. And these all kind of solidified professional service as a viable career path for middle and upper class men, right? Uh, German officers also helped found and run the uh, Superior War College, uh, the Staff College for Armed Forces, for the Armed Forces that provided kind of pathways for promotion. Uh, and even here in the picture, you can see these two soldiers. These are two Argentine soldiers in the 1930s. Um, the officer corps at the time in the first half of the 20th century were especially influenced by the German tradition of, of military training. Um, you know, the, the, their uniforms you can see look like German uniforms. Um, they, you know, they had a deep respect for, you know, Prussian and German um, um, schools of military uh, service. Um, and that, that would later change by the 1950s. The US began to kind of supplant the German tradition, um, but at least in the first half, it was, it was very German. And you know, as officers adopted these standards, you know, because they were at the time becoming some of the most specialized professionals in the country, they also cultivated an elitist posture towards civilians and civilians in government, particularly, who they saw, you know, the military saw these civilian you know, politicians and presidents as their counterparts. Um, and, they, and they felt that they were uh, inept and very inefficient in managing uh, domestic matters. And this was really inspired from the ways in which past presidential administrations handled the officer corps from the early 1900s uh, through, through the Peronist era. So up until really uh, the 1950s. Oftentimes presidents would, you know, they purge the officer corps of their political enemies. Uh, they'd use promotions as a way to shore up and maintain their political support um, by keeping their allies kind of as to at, at top levels as the commanders in chief. Um, and you can say that the presidents used the officer corps as a source of patronage. Right? And professional officers, right, the ones who didn't wish the corps to be seen as, you know, a political instrument, they viewed this corruption with a lot of disdain, and they referred to it as, you know, very inefficient, and they believed it sullied or, or it, it kind of um, weakened and tarnished the spirit of the nation, which, you know, they viewed as being synonymous with the officer corps itself. So, the end result of military professionalism or professionalization can thus be thought of as professional militarism uh, or a belief among officers that they really were best equipped to solve social and economic problems based on a military ethos that prized you know, this technical efficiency and a commitment to patriotism. They were the more authentic kind of um, agents within the nation. And it's an also important to note you know, things like patriotism, the definition of which often changed in different historical periods to serve the needs of the military or its political interests. You know, but you know, as these professional militarists, officers interpreted social and economic crises um, and the instability they produced through a framework of warfare. In their minds, you know, they thought to achieve national greatness uh, and the maintenance of internal order went hand in hand with national development. So on the one hand, you have counterinsurgency, right? This kind of warfare to stifle or to, um, to prevent insurgent forms of mo modernization. And then on the other hand, you have things like economic and social development to move the country forward, right? You can't have one without the other in their minds. So when conventional wars or, or the possibility for a conventional you know, border war in Argentina became really non-existent by you know, 1904, this, ideolo this ideology solidified into demands for industrialization and economic development, you know, not for the sake of making war in the traditional sense, um, but as a prerequisite to att attaining national greatness, which we can think of as kind of this efficient, moral and disciplined society. So an organizational revolution and the emergence of a martial middle class. So as the 1900s progressed and the possibility for conventional warfare remained quite low, uh, 
the armed forces began to shift its functions in ways that reflected its emphasis on industrialization and economic and social development, okay? As the country sought to replace foreign manufactured goods with domestic projects, or pro excuse me, products, which is a process you may have heard of called import substitute industrialization or ISI, the armed forces was one of the only institutions with enough manpower and expertise to make to help make this transition. So this also required more engineers to manage things like military factories, uh, blast furnaces, new steel mills, uh, and chemical production sites that would provide the raw materials for, for, uh, for goods as well as you know, finished goods. Thus, you know, similar to other post-war militaries, Argentina's armed forces underwent you know, this organizational revolution that incorporated more technical skilled work into its functions alongside its traditional specialty in waging war. And this transformation also meant that work in military manufacturing, typically staffed by engineers, began to more closely resemble you know, civilian white collar jobs. Uh, engineers who staffed you know, military factories often worked alongside civilian professionals in these hybrid organizations that were run by boards made up of generals and private businessmen. Uh, and the military's greater involvement in manufacturing uh, is also visible in kind of the demographic data that past scholars have compiled on the officer corps. So here we have a table from Jose Luis de Amas's study called Los Que Mandan, or in English, Those Who Rule, which came out in 1964. And he shows us, he, you know, he, which, was one of the uh, first studies to compile a lot of demographic data, not only on generals, but on, on the Argentine officer corps more generally. And he shows us that by in 1961, the share of generals who specialized in engineering reached about one third, um, up from only a handful uh, and virtually none prior to the 1950s. So, you know, and he's measuring this by counting the number of graduates from each academy. And the second one here, the Escuela Superior Tecnica, or the EST is the Army's engineering school, right? So um, generals had to fulfill a certain uh, educational um, obligation to reach the rank of general. And he's counting, he's showing us that more by the 60s were choosing to become engineers. And 18 out of 54 by 1961 uh, were engineers. Moreover, right, the military's engineering school, you know, the EST, it turned out over 200 graduates between 1950 and 1960, which is a number that really denotes this kind of shift towards the need for, um, you know, um, technical, uh, he, he actually called them um, entrepreneur technicians is what Imaz called them, but the need for more specialized professionals to kind of oversee this um, economic shift in this, um, uh, in Argentina. So just to go, if I can go back, whoops. So if we look back, if we go back, um, you know, military and, and military engineers, their special role in industry was most visibly institutionalized through the creation of the General Directorate of Military Factories or the DGFM in 1941. And if you look at the back of this slide, you see this symbol is FM uh, that stands for Fabricaciones Militares, which was the DGFM's kind of the company and its factories that they established. And they would produce a lot of goods, you know, consumer goods as well as like arms and weaponry for the military as well. Um, you know, and, it, and the DGFM was really a government agency that was staffed by engineers that had broad powers to explore and exploit industrial resources for heavy industry, you know, like steel, iron, um, oil, for example, other minerals. Um, and they often produced these joint partnerships with private businesses. So they would, they would kind of exploit the raw materials and then they would also manufacture finished goods as well. And a fun fact about the DGFM, oh, not really fun, but you know, remember when I talked about these military factories or excuse me, military factions, the political factions, the DGFM was infamously staffed by these Catholic nationalists. Um, and its director in the late fifties and early sixties was a guy named General Armando Martijena. Um, and he was part of a group of officers of the, you know, the first kind of group of officers in the late 50s that um, were proponents of this incoming counterinsurgency doctrine. Uh, and in 1958, you know, the first civilian election in Argentina after Perón was ousted, uh, Arturo Frondizi won, won the election. Martijena worked with a group of kind of civilian technocrats and other generals 
um, to try to thwart the incoming of the civilian president, right? He wanted a military dictatorship. So we can kind of see like he's working with these civilian technocrats. We can kind of see like the proto rendering of this of bureaucratic authoritarianism kind of before the 70s. Um, and, and we kind of see how, you know, this manufacturing was deeply tied uh, to these kind of ideological or, or uh, political kind of initiatives that, that was going on within the military. And while the military had historically drawn officers from the ranks of the upper and middle classes, its post-war adoption of manufacturing duties meant that officers' technical skills and their specialized education, uh, these were no longer specifically reserved just for things like military strategy, uh, for warfare technologies, or even kind of geopolitical warfare in, in the traditional sense, right? Uh, instead, officers, especially engineers and those with engineering qualifications, began to take on work that in many ways mirrored an emerging white collar class of civilian workers, right? They were managing factories. Um, they were um, producing kind of airplanes and automobiles and things like that. Um, however, because of their unique kind of history of professionalization and you know, their strength as one of the country's kind of largest and most institutionalized organizations, um, officers maintained this self image as, you know, repositories of national patriotism. And, you know, perhaps more importantly, they also enjoyed certain benefits, um, you know, legal and extra legal uh, that stemmed from the growth of military industry between 1940 and 1960, which set, really uh, set them apart from a civilian middle class in a couple ways. Um, so we can think of as like the martial middle class emerging um, with this kind of growth in industrial expansion. So the benefits of being an officer. So in the course of his decades spanning research uh, on the Argentine army and, and, and armed forces, uh, Robert Potash, who he, he's famous for authoring three volumes of what's called the army and politics in Argentina. He, um, he shows us that by the 1960s, officers received a variety of benefits that included medical care for themselves and their families, um, you know, moving allowances when they were stationed abroad, but importantly, right, and in a country that suffered a housing shortage and a scarcity of mortgage money in the 50s and 60s, military officials and officers were granted these kind of special arrangements, Potash calls them, that allowed them an advantage to access to homes and home loans. So the Ayuda Financiera, or the military's retirement and pension agency, it purchased, um, built, and sold homes. Uh, and they sold them to officers and they provided really easy access to credit. Um, sometimes, you know, officers would get 50 year mortgages, um, which was a, a huge kind of advantage for them. And as a result, you know, officers regularly owned these really modern apartments and family homes in the federal capital. And something we think about, or maybe we can kind of tie this to changing um, gender norms or, or kind of ideas about gender, um, especially in the federal capital, there was not only a housing shortage, there was also a huge discrepancy between the number of families and the number of family homes. So homes that could fit families, um, something like 30%, I think was the discrepancy. So we see like, it, it's not, um, you know, it suggests that, you know, officers who had this advantage to access to homes were able to more easily adopt more heteronormative or, or these kind of um, nuclear families. There were less obstacles in their way to forming these things, right? Um, and I'll kind of elaborate a little more on that later, but we can kind of just see how, um, you know, just from the kind of economic data or the demographic data, how those things could kind of play out. Um, and moreover, you know, not only with housing, pensions in the military were quite generous for officers. Uh, a cadet who entered the military academy at age 18 could retire with full pay before they reached, reached the age 50. So, you know, it was, it was pretty, pretty good, uh, all things considered. Um, and arguably most reflective of kind of this emerging martial middle class was the opportunity for officers retired, but also sometimes serving to apply their skills to the private sector. Um, the growth of new kind of private industries with which the military had a hand in producing, you know, like, like metallurgy or automobile manufacturing and, and chemical production, stuff like that it created additional outlets for technically trained officers to supplement their pay and even like double dip on their pensions. So additionally, you know, and I think I said this before, but a practice that became really common was also for senior officers to join the boards of directors for private companies, or at least kind of these hybrid companies 
and remember this was a state planned economy um, where they would essentially kind of fulfill public relations roles. Uh, they would handle press a lot and, and stuff like that. Um, I guess in the times when the military was popular, um, but they would also kind of manage relationships with other government agencies, you know, cause they had this experience and they had kind of relationships and connections um, uh, to government. And this essentially created a revolving door of these military experts who could use their skills to their economic advantage as these hybrid industries grew. So many of these benefits were created or enhanced um, in the late 1950s, right after the fall of Perón. Uh, and if we look at the number of cadets who entered the military college by 1961, uh, these benefits, they, their creation, or at least their enhancement seems to have coincided with a market increase in cadets, right? So we see down here um, on the same table, we're, we're back at Imasis Los Quemandan. Uh, here's a new table. He's measuring the number of cadets in the military college. So between 1956 and 61, there's an over 400 person increase right at this time, which you know could suggest that um, the military was popular or you know there was more kind of economic advantage to joining the military at the time. Uh, and before I get a question on the 1,877 number, that's kind of a really high number. Uh, Imas doesn't really give us a lot of information on why that's so high. He kind of just says, well, it's right before the revolution of 1943, which um, you know, he doesn't really elaborate. But remember, you know, from uh, if if we remember kind of military professionalization, this is also at the at the tail end of the military's professionalization process. And we have a larger military, it needs more personnel. Uh, there's World War II is going on, you know, and although, you know, the Argentine military, they remain neutral for the most part, you know, we have just an expanding organization at the time, you know. Um, and scholars kind of argue that, you know, we see these numbers, they're, they're very kind of disparate, or, or at least kind of variant. There's a lot of variance. They argue that enrollment often waxed and waned, depending on the popularity of the military in the country at the time. But it's also important to note that the military was often able to influence um, its perception among officers and the public. Um, and they often used economic benefits to stabilize the officer corps and maintain professionalism, right? So, if there's another another example, if we use kind of the election of 1958 again, you know, Arturo Frondizi won the election, right? And the ruling junta at the time, uh, which was led by uh, General Pedro Aramburu, they wanted to hand over power to a civilian president, right? They were predominantly the liberal faction, right? Um, however, a lot of the officers in the officer corps, so like lower and middling rank officers, were not happy with Frondizi's victory. They actually, most of them supported his opponent, Ricardo Barbin. Um, and they were, there was talks of a coup, of not allowing Frondizi to take office. So Frondizi knew this. And so he kind of entered into ne negotiations with the junta and he said, listen, if, you know, I I'll let you, I'll let the junta pass whatever decree it wants. You know, so he essentially gave them a blank check until the moment I take office and I promise not to repeal anything you pass. So the junta, in order to kind of win over the officers, the first decree they pass is to double every officer's salary across the board. So we kind of see how it was they the, the, they were able to kind of um, lower and middling rank officers did have some political influence over the process, but these kind of we I guess we can call this an extra legal benefit, right? Um, their political unrest or the possibility that they may be politically active could actually benefit them financially, you know in the form of, you know, there were often times where their, their salaries were increased um, and waxed and, you know, uh, it waxed and waned, right? And what's more, you know, this new uh, prospect for officers to supplement their pay in the private sector, it really represents a shift in how many officers understood their conduct and their, prof their, their professionalism. So previously, you know, we have here two takes on private remuneration, uh, as they called it, you know, it was often depicted pejoratively. Officers shouldn't seek uh, private work outside of their official duties. Um, so on the right, we have um, Sergeant Major Alberto Capivila, who was a, a fairly well-known uh, officer um, at the turn of the century. He, he actually helped found the Argentine military's, it, it's like premier academic journal, uh, Revista Militar. Uh, and he was kind of a big a liberal reformer within the military. He was big on like education and things like that. So he was addressing cadets, um, I think in 1894, who were about to graduate. And he said, listen, you know, uh, 
careerism or uh, uh, solely for financial gain uh, is actually this false mirage. You know, he actually called it reprobate um, because, you know, a soldier or a professional officer should always put, you know, the nation and national service of, uh, ahead of their own, you know, financial gain or personal interests. Um, you know, fast forward to 1965, on the left here, we have General Benjamin Rattenbach, who was also a very famous kind of public figure as well in Argentina. He famously authored the, you know, the postmortem report on the Falklands Malvinas War in 1982. But he would also write like all these treatises uh, in the 20th century. And in 1965, in one of his treatises, he wrote that not only was kind of private remuneration a good thing, it was actually, officers were actually obliged to seek private work if the state didn't provide, you know, a, a comfortable standard of living for them as well as their families. You know, so we have, you know, there's lots to unpack there, right? He, you know, we have this kind of long-standing idea of professional militarism. You know, the state, you know, is not uh, capable or at least not always willing to um, respect and to compensate in this case, um, the true kind of bearers of national, uh, national of the nation. And we also have this, you know, this little bit of, of gender analysis in there, this assumption that, you know, not only should officers have kind of families, but that their salaries should be enough to support an entire family, right? So it's small, but we, we can kind of start to, um, to learn certain things about how officers understood kind of how gendered relationships should work. And kind of to segue, you know, where do the families come in? Yeah, so what does the emergence of a martial middle class have to do with families? You know, so up until this point, I've kind of outlined a historical narrative that demonstrates how military officers during the post peronist era, so after 1955, uh, how they took on more technical white collar labor in things like manufacturing, and how they incorporated their traditional notions of you know, honor, cohesion, uh, and patriotism or professionalism into the country's um, modernization projects and their theory for modern uh, modernization. But at the same time, and as I explained earlier, the military's understanding of modernization can be described as this balancing act, right? A society should constantly change, it should constantly move forward, um, and economic growth and moral discipline, which often included, you know, acts of state violence, would ensure that, equ that this equilibrium, right, would be maintained. You know, change was good if change was good. Uh, and this was, in effect, the officer corps' conceptualization of, you know, counterinsurgency in a way. It was against this idea of insurgent modernization that they saw in the forms, you know, in forms of Peronism uh, and Marxist-Leninism, but also countercultural phenomena expressed within, you know, youth movements, uh, Latin American feminism, uh, and kind of like an entrance of more women into the workforce and things like that. Um, and military families of, you know, it's important, we often think of as the military, or at least the officer corps, as being siloed off from those cultural changes, or standing completely opposed to them, you know. But it's important to note, you know, that, you know, and it's, I think it's a little understudied, is that, you know, military families uh, in the Argentine officer corps, and communities of military families, lived and worked among these cultural changes. Um, however, you know, at the same time, they also staffed managed and assembled a key component of counterinsurgency warfare, right? They oversaw the manufacturing and the processing of consumer goods, uh, as well as arms that would later be used to more forcefully police the terms of modernization. Right? Um, and just to bring up the DGFM again, you know, the DGFM made a lot of goods. They were also the subject of multiple arms dealing scandals during the Cold War, right? They often provided weapons to allied nations engaged in, you know, counterinsurgencies of their own. I think uh, one of the most infamous was uh, in the early 80s, they provided rifles and weapons to the Salvadoran um, um, military during, you know, the beginning of their civil war. Um, and in the early 90s, you know, they were all, all also kind of arms dealing to, I think it was Ecuador and Croatia. Uh, Carlos Menem was the president at the time, was indicted for those. Uh, the charges were dropped. But, you know, th this is exa an example of how kind of manufacturing, or at least creating modern consumer goods, um, is one part, but also kind of manufacturing counterinsurgency in a more literal fashion, right? The logistics of, you know, how to wage, you know, anti-subversive warfare. So modernization change and, you know, warfare were connected in these fundamental ways. Uh, and while we can outline kind of the historical forces that led to the emergence 
of a better paid and you know, well-educated class of military families, we still know very little about how such families organize their daily lives, uh, especially in the context of modernization and counterinsurgency. So what's next, right? Uh, right now, I think historians are really faced with a missing piece of the puzzle, uh, especially if we consider how juntas often made decisions, like I said before, uh, to ensure the loyalty and stability of the officer corps, to which you know, Potash, uh, Imas, and their colleagues, their work attests. Um, you know, lower and middling rank officers thus had some power. It remains to be seen how much to influence the terms of modernization. And if that's the case, then historians need to take a closer look at the military communities, the wider communities that were engaged in its processes and connected through not only kind of their shared professional military labor, but also the reproductive labor that sustained such projects. Um, like, like I've been talking about kind of professional military labor, like manufacturing, military education and things like that. But it's important to remember that, you know, we can't forget reproductive labor and how, you know, families and, and gendered labor and, and kind of gendered relationships helped support um, the military and its projects in general. You know, so we need to start, I think, you know, questions we need to start asking are like, how did mili uh, marriage practices affect military families division of this labor, you know? What role did things like child rearing and education play in preparing young Argentines for the future? Um, did women of the martial middle class employ domestic workers in ways that allowed them to participate in community engagements outside the home that, you know, sustain these military values? Uh, and finally, you know, were these military families exposed to changing norms regarding, you know, gender relationships and parenthood that other civilian urban middle class families helped develop in the 60s and 70s? And there I'm thinking really of, of kind of Isabella Cosse's work on, on, on families in, in the 70s. So I think answering these questions not only sheds light on, you know, Argentina's officer corps in ways that supplements our, stand, our understanding of military politics, uh, it could also demonstrate how beliefs about gender were fundamental to kind of the military, the military, its values, social relations within military communities more generally, uh, plans for development, and Cold War counterinsurgency. And you know, this is already like this is obviously the most ambitious part of my research. And you know, I'm still kind of in the process of searching for archives and and kind of establishing um, sources that would substantiate this. You know, COVID-19 has been kind of hard. Uh, you can't really travel and things like that. Um, but importantly, uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot of research that on the one hand lends itself to such a project. And on the other, it needs to be done to fully understand who the people of the Marshall middle class were and to what extent they benefited from building families and communities that upheld these shared military values. Yeah. So thank you, I, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to the sponsors, the LAII, CNM, the Mellon Foundation, uh, and then Humanities Now and his, the History Department, I appreciate it. A warm Zoom round of applause. Thank you so much, Dylan. Um, I really enjoyed your talk and learned a lot. Um, we do have about 10 minutes for questions. So I will open it up to questions from the audience. Um, if you would like, you can, you can unmute yourself and voice your question, um, raise your hand just so that we can uh, make sure to get everyone in some sort of order <laughs> in terms of answering questions, or you can put questions in the chat. So please go ahead. All right, uh, Christian. Hey, Kai, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dylan, that, that was really interesting. Um, I'm from Chile, not Argentina, so my accent might be confusing, but uh, I wonder how long in time are you allowed to do your research and how much this dynamic that you described so interestingly uh, change during the dictatorship and then also change after the Malvinas and after the, the biggest defeat of the, of the military, which is the, 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 the trials and the, and, the, and the human rights situation now, but also the, the image of the military of Argentina now uh, after, especially with Kirchner that was very strong against the military culture and the privileges and, uh, and I imagine, usually a group that has 
benefit from these privileges when you are taking away your privilege, there's a lot of resentment. Uh, so how far can you go? And is it possible to include uh, some of these more later developments? Uh, I think that the, the, the focal on issues is, is, is a devastating thing for the, for the identity of the military families. Uh, so I, I'll be very interested on, on, on learning those, those more recent dynamics over the last four years. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question. And I think, you know, the Malvinas uh, is very, like, I'm still kind of trying to form the chronology of this project as well. So the one, one reason I kind of stop at 75 is because, you know, I wanted to stop before the Dirty War, right, to show what's happening really in the 50s and 60s. But I think you're right. Like, I think another neglected part, or at least kind of maybe a, a, maybe a, a part of Argentine history that's now becoming more ripe for historical research is like the 1980s. And um, in particular, like not only the Malvinas, but um, the years like the early, like 1980, 1981, um, in which the, the DGFM and, and the, the, the final junta, the final final junta, um, I think it was uh, like under Galtieri, how they, they used um, uh, the DGFM to engage in these arms deals, like I mentioned, but also kind of to create or to kind of participate in this network of mainly kind of Central and Latin American, Central and South American states um, engaged in counterinsurgency. I'm not, so like, I'm not sure exactly how, you know, what the Marshall middle class, how that kind of shifted into the 80s or 90s. But I think like what you're, what you describe, or at least what you're, what you're kind of asking about, um, is another stage in, in, in how the military perceived itself professionally. Like if we can think of um, professional, the history of Argentine military professionalization, you know, in waves, like starting in the early 1900s, and then they re-professionalize in the 50s or so. And then again, in the 80s, 90s, they re-professionalize, -re um, you know, maybe even once in the 80s and again in the 90s when, you know, they're, they're particularly, um, punished to an extent for, for their participation. Um, you know, I think like that's, that's maybe one way that we can kind of perceive uh, of military history outside of kind of the formal politics, or at least, um, um, you know, uh, democratic transitions or lack thereof. You know, I, th I think like one part of the history that, you know, has, is particularly well trodden is, you know, Argentine history narrated as kind of a series of, you know, elections and coups, elections and coups. Um, you know, so one way to understand or to think about the, the military besides that is, you know, what was actually going on inside the military, um, not just among generals, but among kind of the rank and file, so to speak, in the officer corps and expanding that definition to kind of include not only military men, but, you know, their family members and stuff like that. So, I, um, you know, I didn't really answer your question fully because but, but I understand what you're saying and, I, and it's something I'm thinking about. Go ahead, John. I think you're muted. There we go. Hey, got it. Okay. Uh, this goes to the beginning of your talk. Uh, in a lot of respects, Argentina was one of the losers of World War II. In other words, the Brazilians and so on just leaped ahead of them militarily. And the Brazilians got all the weapons and so on that were available and Argentina got very little. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how that changed the perceptions of professionalism and was that a spur towards the professionalism and ultimately the martial middle class and to what extent were the Argentines trying to keep up with the Brazilians? Yeah, that, that's a really, that's a, a great point that you bring up. So um, Argentina was certainly, um, the Argentine military was certainly like a, a loser, so to speak, of World War II, mainly because they were, they were neutral. So they were kind of um, at odds with the US for most of the 1940s. And it resulted in an arms embargo against uh, particularly the, the army. Right. So the, the U.S. instituted an arms embargo. 
many times the, the Argentine government got around the arms embargo. I think they, they got a bunch of weapons, um, lower quality weapons they would buy from, um, man, I want to say it was uh, Czechoslovakia or, or something like that. Um, but, but so like to, to the, you know, we think of the things like the, the establishment of the DGFM, so and, and ISI, Import Substitute Industrialization, the arms embargo required the Argentine military to start manufacturing its own weapons. So, um, and that certainly kind of affected um, the military professionals, we'll call them, their kind of emphasis on industrial expansion. So part of the reason um, they wanted, they were so committed to industrial expansion was also so that they could kind of maintain um, technology or they can kind of keep up with technology and they can develop it themselves. You know, it was easier said than done, but, um, but that certainly had, um, you know, that was one of the reasons why the military's special relationship, so to speak, with industry um, occurred at the time it did and at the speed it did. I think um, it, was, it was really a post-war phenomenon that stemmed in large part um, to the arms embargo and kind of their experience um, geopolitically uh, after World War II. Since I'm not seeing a hand, I'm going to use my authority to ask a question here. Um, so I, I'm teaching a, a survey on modern Latin America right now, as well as a class called Intro to Historical Study um, that doesn't really have a, um, a chronological or geographical focus, but instead is focusing on historical thinking and research. And so um, what I'm curious about, uh, hearing about your uh, your project and the way that you've defined it's, you know, where it's going to fit into the his historiography. Um, and I know you said, you know, and we're all facing the issue of, of COVID-19 and inability to travel, but um, what, what archives are you looking to visit in terms of being able to locate the voices of the martial middle class? And I, I'm thinking not just of the officers, but of their families, of their, of their spouses, their children. Um, and have you been able to access anything digitally? So yeah, that, that's really, that's like the main obstacle in my research right now, just kind of establishing those relationships. Um, you know, like, and, and I think how it's going to work is um, there's a lot of room, I think, like, you know, depending on what Argentina looks like with respect to COVID, um, you know, uh, an oral kind of oral history and projects like that may not be feasible. So I may have to kind of shift how I'm going to approach this. But, um, you know, I think like identifying certain military communities in the federal capital area. So, um, and kind of like working, starting with the DGFM, because uh, they have like a central archive uh, in the uh, AGN, the Intermedio, and kind of working out from there. And, and figuring out kind of what the where these communities are, you know, where particularly are army engineers located, you know, in, in, in this equation, and then kind of looking at, you know, how these communities are constructed. So do they have primary schools? Do they have secondary schools, right? Do they have certain um, kind of organizations for the wives of military men and things like that, and seeing if they have papers? I mean, one good thing about, uh, about Buenos Aires in particular is you know a lot of great historians have uh, gender historians have done so much work kind of creating um, um, textual archives like archives with textual materials that deal with gender. So and, and you know there's a, there's a large network down there. But I think um, you know right now my plan is to kind of figure out where these locations are and start with kind of the work with certain organizations and institutions and then kind of try to work to um, become accepted and form relationships with maybe kind of the descendants of, of officers uh, or officers themselves. You know, it's, they'd probably be getting pretty up there in age by now, but, um, but that's kind of how I'm, I'm starting to approach this. Um, and that's kind of my plan so far. All right. Um, well, thank you again so much, Dylan. We've, we've hit 401. So um, very much appreciate your willingness to come and, and share with us today. And thank you to all who have attended. Um, hope you have a, a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.